There we are, Holmes. I've told you in great detail everything that happened last night. Excellent work, Watson. We shall now be prepared to answer a few questions about the horrible murder in Hanbury Street. Do you think we are now in a position to find out the identity of the murderer of these two women? No, I don't think so. It's outside of our scope and not our responsibility. As much as you've done for Leather Apron and the affair with the pills, our mission is to help the police by ensuring that they don't get caught up following false leads and to point them in the right direction. Let us start from what we know with some certitude. As you have just said, it is almost certain that the same person killed the Bucks Row and Hanbury Street victims. The reason to assume as much are numerous and I shan't elaborate here. What do these two victims have in common? It's true these two women were in the same profession, but... Indeed, Watson. These two women were both prostitutes. That is of vital importance, Watson. My memory from your examination of the scene is rather hazy. Didn't you say something about the killer's frame of mind? I was talking about the victim's possessions that were placed on the ground and the rings missing from Annie Chapman's fingers. This killer is a cunning predator, comes from a rather humble background and shows steely self-control in carrying out the murders. Something is puzzling me, Holmes. Richardson's testimony contradicts the time of death given by Dr. Phillips, which also matches my own, 4.30 a.m. And yes, we shall confirm that, Watson, and attempt to determine the precise time of death. In order to do that, we will need to place everyone involved on a timeline. Only after that will we be able to place the knife symbolizing our killer. Let's look at our timeline, Watson. Let's put the time of death as assessed by Dr. Phillips on the timeline. The assessment of the time of the murder given by Dr. Phillips and yourself, Watson, 4.30 a.m.
We left the station at 6 o'clock and it took us 20 minutes to arrive at Hanbury Street. Our arrival at the scene occurred at around 6.20. Given the distance separating the two locations, we can deduce that the corpse wasn't discovered after 6 o'clock and therefore that the murder must have been committed before. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. Despite the great respect I have for Dr. Phillips and the value I place on our friendship, my deepest conviction is that both of you are mistaken and that Richardson is in the right and that these two testimonies put down in writing have real worth. But how? Explain yourself, Holmes. Remember how you assessed the time of death? You touched the fingers and body of the victim, but it was remarkably cold for this time of year. In addition, the corpse had been drained of bodily fluids. Its heat retention was therefore no longer the same as that of an intact corpse. Egad! You're right, Holmes. Oh, I've had some time to research, Watson. Given these facts, my first diagnosis may have been off by half an hour, perhaps even an hour. Thus, we can confirm Richardson's statement and establish that the murder was committed after 4.50 a.m. and not before 4.30 a.m. Our next witness is Albert Kadosh. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Albert Kadosh goes down into his garden at approximately 5.20 and on re-entering his home, hears voices in number 29's garden.
Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh goes back down into his garden approximately four minutes after having left it and hears the sound of an impact against the wooden fence. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh leaves the garden, enters his house, then leaves for work, seeing the clock on the Spitalfields church showing 5.32. Now, for the most important part, the testimony of Miss Long. She claims to have seen a woman speaking to a man near 29 Hanbury Street sometime around... What time, Watson? Let us assume, therefore, that Miss Long's testimony is, as is most certainly the case, true. She places her meeting with the victim at around 5.30, claiming to have heard a clock chime on the half hour at the moment when she enters the street. Excellent, Watson. All our people are now in place. Yes, but Holmes, Miss Long, claims to have seen the victim at around 5.30. But according to Kadosh, someone, most certainly the victim and her murderer, was already in the garden at 5.30. Excellent observation, Watson. It must be noted, however, that these two witnesses, Long and Kadosh, saw the time shown on the clocks in the area, which are often inaccurate and went by their empirical and, in this case, erroneous estimate of how much time had passed. Thus, neither of these two times can be considered reliable. Do you mean to say that these two testimonies might match? Indeed. Let's put Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30. Let's add Miss Long's meeting with the victim at 2 minutes before 5.30 a.m. Mr. Kadosh claims to have passed by the Spitalfields Church at 5.32, which given the distance from 27 Hanbury Street would mean he was still at home at 5.31. Let's therefore put the end of his testimony at 5.31. Miss Long heard the man say to the victim, Will you... To which the victim responded, Yes, which would suggest that an agreement was reached and that the transaction was imminent. They then proceeded to enter the garden, which puts the voices heard by Kadosh at 5.29. We had thought that Kadosh had left 27 Hanbury Street at 5.31 after having heard an impact against the fence. Thus, two minutes passed between the moment when Kadosh entered the house after having been in the garden the first time and the moment when he returns to go out again and leave for work. How long did he estimate this interval to be? Three to four minutes. In light of all this, Watson, we can finally establish the time of Chapman's murder. Now, place the knife at the exact time.
Now then, taking into account that the local clock isn't exact and that a young man was off by a minute or two in his estimations of his comings and goings, we can confirm Miss Long's testimony and place the time of the crime at approximately 5.30. But in that case, Holmes, the man that Miss Long saw is none other than... That's right, Watson. It was the Whitechapel killer. To think that Miss Long and Kadosh were only a few feet away from him. Indeed, Watson. Had Miss Long passed just a little closer to the victim and her assassin, or had the young Kadosh popped his head over the fence out of curiosity, the killer would most certainly already be behind bars. That's some stroke of luck he had there. I couldn't agree more, Watson. But his luck didn't end there, given the mutilations inflicted upon this poor woman. What must be considered, above all, is the killer's obvious wish to remove one and only one specific organ. His surgery pinpointed the exact spot, avoiding superfluous incisions. This suggests the man possesses at least a minimal anatomical knowledge. Are you suggesting a, a doctor or a butcher? Perhaps, but the possibilities are still too broad to conclude with any certainty. Now for the motive. Despite my almost complete lack of practical experience on the subject, I have a rather precise idea of the usefulness of a uterus and a vagina. Nonetheless, once they are separated from their usual envelope, I am more circumspect as to the uses one can make of them. What do you think, Watson? We need a board, Watson. it was intended as a study specimen. I have little faith in that theory. Hardly anything was taken from the Bucks Row victim. Money, quite simply. Even if this motive seems incongruous, we're in no position to deny or affirm it until we know whether a market for human organs exists. Black magic? Watson, this line of investigation is far too vague. We don't have a single clue in support of such a motive. We can eliminate this hypothesis. Holmes, what if it was cannibalism? Even if the idea is unbearable, uh, we can't ignore it as a possibility. A desire for some sort of morbid trophy. I'd be inclined to dismiss this motive. If this were the case, why would nothing have been removed from the Bucks Row victim? Elementary.
What emerges from these possible motives for having removed the uterus from the second victim is that they implied that the killer could have carried out the same thing on the Bucks Row victim, yet didn't. This brings us to a terrible conclusion. Our killer has evolved in the space of only a few days, and if that's the case, had he already struck before the first murder to which we attribute him? And if the killer strikes again, what atrocity awaits his next victim? We have to stop him, Holmes. We shall do our best. This recent business of jars filled with formalin and of the American doctor might be a lead. Watson, inquire among medical circles to ascertain if there is a black market for human organs. The chances are slim, but this must be pursued. Very well. What about you, Holmes? I will send word to Inspector Abiline regarding our recent conclusions. I should also like to become a gas man and pay a visit to Bluto at the Wasp's Nest. Understood, Holmes. I think one of my old university colleagues who works at the London Hospital will be able to help me. I shall write him a note at once. He should be able to see me during the day. Afterwards, shall we meet here? Yes, Watson. See you later, and good luck. I must get to the London Hospital, where my old university colleague works. This is the coal bucket in which Holmes keeps his cigars. What a funny idea. Holmes uses this old Persian slipper to hold his pipe tobacco. I must get to the London Hospital, where my old university colleague works. To the London Hospital, quick! My colleague agreed to meet me here in one of the London Hospital rooms reserved for students. Ah, John, you're there already. Punctual as always. Tell me, you don't seem to be in good shape. Is it possible that your recent marriage is making you this morose? Ah, you know me well, Andrew. No, it's a strange and terrible affair that concerns me. Have you read my note? Yes, I admit that I was surprised. It just so happens that I too was asking questions about our morgue. What do you think? Have you heard of any organ trafficking within? No, no, John. No doubt there exists some exchange between colleagues. Not quite legal, of course, but nothing that can qualify as trafficking. Since the Anatomy Act of 1832, which permitted the use of unclaimed corpses for science, the black market trade was definitely halted. There are sufficient subjects available for all practitioners and students. Of this, I can confirm. Well, organ trafficking as a lucrative trade is out of the question. Then what is troubling you with the morgue? You are talking about trafficking organs. But I suspect there is trade in whole bodies. What do you mean to say? Whole bodies are disappearing? Well, it's confidential, but I know of your discretion and your friendship with the famous Sherlock Holmes. I can tell you that a few corpses have recently disappeared from the hospital morgue. Cadavers that were intended for dissection. That is to say, not claimed. Poor, unknown people. If a single corpse had disappeared, it might have been a bad joke. There are many students who pass through here. It's even a meeting spot. For the majority, they are here to work. A few come here in secret to practice. It also happens that instruments or organs go missing. Nothing alarming, but so many corpses. It's very troubling. But the hospital doctors aren't doing anything? No, 
That is to say, they would prefer not to call the police at this point. An investigation would no doubt result in the suspension of authorizations for the use of unclaimed corpses. Do you think that you could intercede on our behalf with Sherlock Holmes to clear up this situation? Which corpses are missing? Ah, I don't know exactly, but I can make an exact list if you would like to wait here for a few minutes. Feel free to look around the room while you wait. It'll bring back memories. Thank you, Andrew. It's here that students come to carry out their experiments. This rag is full of grease. It certainly wasn't used for a dissection. Was someone doing some mechanical work here? The last lesson must have been about the human heart. And for a class of beginners, I expect, as this diagram is rather rudimentary. It's here that students come to carry out their experiments. An encyclopedia of anatomy. A page on the human heart is dog-eared. Let's see. It's here that students come to carry out their experiments. This surgical instrument resembles a screwdriver. How amusing. It might come in handy. I will return it later. This wheel won't roll despite all of the added grease. Curious, as Holmes would say. These wheel trolleys are very handy for laying out surgical instruments. This wheel won't roll despite all of the added grease. Curious, as Holmes would say. A message? I'll be... Why the devil was it hidden here? An old prescription. Poor child, so young, yet terminally ill. Strange, someone scrawled something. Part of it is in Latin. These are instructions, it would seem. The last lesson must have been about the human... There is a heart in this jar. Based on its colouring, it hasn't been there long, and it looks like the drawing on the board. This jar contains two lids with combination locks.
Look, there was a bit of paper stuck between the two lids. Incredible! Someone has hidden a magnet in this heart. But to what end? Nothing of interest here. Nothing of interest here. Nothing of interest here. Nothing of interest here. Incredible! There is a magnet with a hook behind this pane of glass. I am in need of something.
There, all done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. A hole? I could make out something inside, but how to get it out? I will need a hook. I found it! Hmm, a coded message. I do believe I will need Holmes. Here is the list, John. The missing corpses are those of a woman, 40 years old, beginning of August, another, 55 years old, two weeks ago, and recently, a young woman. These corpses had nothing in common except that they didn't have any apparent lesions. All of this is very troubling. Well, I think that I have all of the information possible, and I promise that I will do what I can to clear up this business. I must leave you, my friend, and... In the name of our friendship, please, don't cause a stare. To be sure. Thanks again, Andrew. It is I who must thank you, John. Don't forget to keep me up to date and say hello to your charming wife for me. Count on me, Andrew. I must go to the wasp's nest to find this rogue that Watson dubbed Bluto. He may be able to provide information on Dr. Tumblety. This lead, although tenuous, is well worth following. I must return to Whitechapel, but it would be better if I did so incognito. This should do the trick. Let's go. Let's go to the wasp's nest. Will it be? Hmm. I have nothing to ask. Oi, what'll it be to drink, Gav? Hmm, there's something here. Hmm, there's something here. I need something. Old Tong. Hmm, there's something here. I see a jewel. It's fallen between the floorboards.
a Hebrew inscription. Going by the length of the chain, it must belong to a child. Hello there. You looking for a gas man? You really a gasser? You sure it isn't a bobby? Well, if you don't need me, I'll be on my way then. I've already been paid up. Stay. Who paid you? A doctor. Marston, I think he was. He told me you'd talk to me about a foreigner name of Tumblety, if I did you a favour. Right, mate. Might happen. What is it you need me to do, then? Listen to me. At the end of Whitechapel, there's an abandoned dump of a house. Opposite Finley's boarding house. Upstairs in the mess where the gas pipes are, you'll find a sack with something heavy inside. If you look in, you'll regret it here. You find it, you bring it here, and you don't tell a soul, right? Got it. And then you'll tell me about this tumble tea so that I can report back to the doc? Yeah. Doctors know people. And since you is here, it's because he'll move mountains for his American. Me? I don't know much. But you can tell him that he'll have to talk to Squibby. He seems to know lots about plenty. When you come back with a sack, I'll tell you what he needs to tell Squibby so that he snitches on the yank to him. Believe me, mate, it's as explosive as ten miles worth of gas in your damn pipes. Right then, I'm off. Go. Give me some air. I could arrange for the police to come down here and arrest this thug, but he seems pretty tough and would probably be a lot less cooperative than if I play along. It's best I handle this myself, including meeting the mysterious Squibby. It's the abandoned house that Bluto pointed out to me. He must have set up his hideout there. Hmm, there's a strange smell coming from this old building. Good day, Finley. Ah, uh, good day, sir. Have we met before? It's me, Sherlock Holmes, but I don't want it to be known that I'm here. Can I count on you? Certainly, Mr. Holmes. I shall be as silent as the grave. Your tenant, Dr. Tumblety, is he here? I don't think so, but go and find out. It would seem you've been having some gas problems. Don't talk to me about it. The problem is from the abandoned house not far from here, but nobody has come to take care of it. Perhaps I could go and take a look. Do you have a ladder? No, but I think in the pile of wood under the stairs there is one in pieces. And if you also need something from the scrap heap, some old tools or who knows what, feel free to take it, Mr. Holmes, but leave the dishes in good condition.
Thank you, and goodbye. And goodbye, Mr. Holmes. This lead pipe could help me to repair the gas lines. A broken hammer, I will have to find a handle. Part of a perfume atomizer. This lead pipe could help me to repair the gas lines. Finley's ladder is smashed to pieces, but all the parts appear to be here. Part of a perfume atomizer. This must be a piece of the ladder. This lead pipe could help me to repair the gas lines. A heap of rusted iron crockery. This old cloth could be used as a mask. I must moisten my makeshift mask. Some old nails, they may come in handy. This must be a piece of the ladder. This must be a piece of the ladder. Water. Water. Closed. Closed. Water.
water. How is your investigation going, Mr. Holmes? Thank you, and goodbye. And goodbye, Mr. Holmes. Closed. Closed. I hope this ladder will support my weight. There is a gas leak. My life will be at risk if I enter the room without protection. I must find something to protect myself with so that I can go in and take a better look. There is a gas leak. My life will be at risk if I enter... This damp cloth will do for a mask. Let's go. My cloth mask won't make much difference, but I'll be able to inspect the room for a few seconds. I need something. I need something. I need something. A small torch, a useful tool for opening safes, I would assume, but the gas bottle is empty. The leak must have been sudden, even the animals didn't have time to escape. This iron bar will help me. Someone left here in a hurry, presumably because of the gas leak. The leak is coming from here. The satchel is behind these pipes. This explains why the thug wanted someone who knew about gas. He must have hidden it there in great haste and broke the pipes in the process. The satchel seems to be quite stuck.
The satchel seems to be quite stuck. I don't think I can get it out without passing out for good. I need a more suitable mask. The kind used by tanners would do nicely. The leak must have been sudden. Even the animals didn't have time to escape. How is your investigation? I'll be needing a mask of the sort tanners use. Do you know where? Go check in the little lane across from the clinic. At the cobblers, perhaps. Thank you, and goodbye. And goodbye, Mr. Holmes. How do, sir? Hello. I'm sorry to say, but I'm closing. This man seems wary. I must find a way to win his confidence. How do, sir? Hello. I'm sorry to say, but I'm closing. This man seems wary. I must find a way to win his confidence. How do, sir? Hello. I'm sorry to say, but I'm closing. I am here because I found this. Abraham's beard. The son of one of my neighbors was beaten in the street a few weeks ago and it was stolen from him. If you would give it to me, I promise to return it to him and get you a reward. Money doesn't interest me. Who are you, sir? And what do you want from me? I'm a friend of Dr. Watson's. Uh, you know him, don't you? In that case, welcome. Dr. Watson is a great man and I would be pleased to help one of his friends. You work the leather and perhaps even tan it yourself. I believe tanners wear special masks to protect themselves from the toxic emissions given off by the vats used to soak the leather. I have a gas leak to fix, and I won't survive without something effective to protect myself with. Go see my cousin Abraham, who has a pet shop a little further down the road. Tell him that Isaac sent you. <laughs> That's me.
I'll be off now. My regards to Dr. Watson. This is a pet shop. Hello, sir. Hello. You must be Abraham Solomonovich. I, I came on behalf of your cousin, Isaac. He said that you might be able to help me. I need a good mask to protect me from gas emissions so I can repair a leak. Yes, it should help you. But I let it drop into the big snake cage and they are very dangerous beasts. I don't know how to retrieve it. But you must be equipped to deal with these creatures safely, surely? Of course, but I broke my hook. It should be over there. If you succeed in getting that beast from its cage, you will be doing me a great favor. I need something. I need something. This cage must do to hold the snake. I have the broken hook. I can repair it, but I'll need some materials. Perhaps I'll find some material at Isaac's that will be of use. Perhaps I'll find some material at Isaac's that will be of use. I need a few items for your cousin Abraham. May I borrow them for you? Of course. You're welcome. This may come in handy. This should do the trick. This should do the trick. This is a pet shop. I need something. I need something. I need something.
No, I can't do that. I need something. This cage must do to hold the snake. This cage must do to hold the snake. will do the trick. The mesh is small enough. I need something. I need something. I need something. There we are, magnificent. If I may ask, why is it you have such equipment? I haven't always had a pet shop, my friend. I was a butcher for many years. But I wasn't serious enough to be a real meat man. And I was looked down upon in the community. I found myself carting carcasses from the slaughterhouse. A repugnant job in which you catch vile illnesses. It breaks you before you're out of your thirties. Thus, I had the idea to make this mask with a sort of filter, and it worked. Since then, I have quit that work, and with my little savings, I started this business. I lived through the death of thousands of animals. Now I am devoted to their lives. If you are interested, I could sell you a little canary, for example. No, thank you. Let's return to the boarding house. Pardon me, but can you give me some information? So, my lord, you looking for love? True love?
Pardon me, but can you give me some information? You too? You're lost? The satchel, rather heavy and firmly wedged, dislodging it will take a concerted effort and is better done in a safe environment. I must repair this leak before I can get the satchel out. There isn't enough gas. The pressure isn't high enough. There isn't enough gas. The pressure isn't high enough. There isn't enough gas. The pressure isn't high enough. The satchel, rather heavy and firm.
the satchel rather heavy and firm. The gas can escape through this nozzle. The gas can escape through this nozzle. There isn't enough gas, the pressure isn't high. The satchel, rather heavy and firmly wedged, dis There isn't enough gas, the pressure isn't high enough. Elementary. This much talked about satchel is very heavy and seems to contain metal dishes. I told Bluto that I wouldn't look inside, but I've little need to. It's quite obvious that it's full of silverware. There is still gas in here. Looking at the state of this cat, it won't survive much longer if it stays here. Let's go to the wasp's nest. Let's go to the wasp's nest.
I need something. There's no way of returning this fortune to that lout Bluto. I will give him the satchel, but with other contents. Hmm, something with the same weight. the sack to me. Did you look in? I give you my word, but it won't belong to you until you tell me where Squibby is. Fine. The poor idiot was taken by the peelers the other day. I don't know why some chap started to screech about it. He was the Whitechapel killer, but he ended up followed by an hysterical mob. In a flash, the bobbies had him rounded up and locked down. Do you mean that the local police station? Might. Might not. But if you or the doc talk to him, Tell him that about the kayak business. I'll forget our score if he rats on a yank. He'll know. Now, hand over the bag. I say, that's all a little bit wishy-washy. I'm not sure it's worth the satchel. Hey, don't shake it like that, moron. If you don't want to end up with a knife in the back, you'll get busy with the pipe. Got it? Here, take it. That'll teach me for being a good Samaritan. Honestly, how rude. I'd best be off now. Better to not be around when he opens the satchel. Jack and apes, you want to ride on the big whirly? Hmm, another day, perhaps, Mum. As a matter of fact, I would like to know if a chap I know called Squibby happens to be in this police station, and how many policemen are inside. Information? Yes, but time is money for me, you know. Here are a few guineas, so. Squibby. I'll tell you everything that I know, my ducky. Nothing. <laughs> I know nothing about whether Squibby is there and I don't give a damn. The bobbies don't whisper sweet nothings to me, like the girls in the nice places. And now I'll get lost before I get all worked up. Hey, if you have something to offer to a lady, I could tell you a little bit more, maybe. I'll be back. You do that. The girls from the nice houses. That monster. Oh. Danny must have been referring to establishments like Miss Bella's that Watson told me about. You still there, honey pie? I'll be back. You do that. Pardon me, but can you give me some information? Come, please. It's quick and it don't cost much. And I'm cold. just waltz into the police station to ask if they've got Squibby locked up. I'll have to come up with a ploy to find out if he's actually there. Then I'll need to get the policeman to leave for just a few minutes so I can talk to the prisoner.
Good evening, Lucy. Do you remember me? Mr. Holmes, come in. You're strangely dressed. What have you come to do in the area? I've come to ask if any of your colleagues, or perhaps even yourself, associate with any of the policemen from the local station. Certain girls go with police officers, it's true. But Bella would be able to tell you more than me. Very well, I'll be on my way. You are a friend of Dr. Watson? Indeed. A fine man, your Dr. Watson. He got me out of a damn business with one of my clients. We gave this boar a lesson to remember, and he's since gone to France, having snagged one of my best girls. But it's a break from all of her chatter. You're looking for information about the police, is that right? I can't help you there. The girls concerned are busy. And anyway, I don't have the time. What is bothering you so much? A client left me a case of bottles as payment. It happens all the time. I'm saddled with all this stuff. He told me that these perfumes were the latest thing straight from Paris. Well, I'd barely smelled the first one when I nearly fainted. There might be some good ones in there, but I'd have to find out if it's really perfume so that it won't burn the skin off my pretty girls. Madam, I will undertake to tell you exactly which of these products are perfumes if you agree to entrust them to me for a little while. In exchange, I would like to know more about Squibby. Yes, I know him. We've struck a deal, Mr. Holmes. I'll give you these bottles. I will need a book to help me identify Miss Bella's perfume. I believe the bookshop on Glenworth Street, not far from Baker Street, has just reopened. Let's go and take a look. Hello, sir. Hello. Are you the new bookseller in the neighbourhood? Yes. My name is Barnes. You're one of my first visitors. Welcome. What are you looking for? I'm looking for a work that can help me identify perfumes, a book that deals with vegetation and its possible uses in the domain, for example. I would recommend the Encyclopedia Spartica about vegetation. It consists of a reference on the matter. This book is the most complete that there is. Fine. I will take it. But it's just that, um, <clears throat> I have no idea where it is. Would you believe that my predecessor classified works by their acquisition date? Nowadays, we advocate a thematic classification. However, I am getting down to the task. You aren't looking for anything concerning the history of the scripts. I'm fascinated by the subject, and I already have numerous books on the topic. It is no doubt very interesting, but I need this book Spartica without further delay. Fine, fine. I will try to find the acquisition date of this encyclopedia, Mr... Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Ah, fantastic. You are the man for the job. Perhaps you could try to find the missing dates. That will buy you some time. There are some dates missing? Yes. I forgot to mention that detail. The dates were written on cardstock attached to the columns, and there was one date per section. As one goes along, you will see there is no specific order, and certain are missing. I remade the labels, but I don't know where to put them. They're there on the counter. Are there any other details to know? The proprietor inscribed a date every two years since his arrival in 1864, up until now, that is, 1888. He left a note regarding his method of shelving, but I didn't understand a word. I do believe, in fact, that he was a bit mad. Well, I will see.
I must put all of the labels back in their rightful place. There, Mr. Barnes, the labels are in their correct places. That should facilitate your classification. Have you found my book? Yes, what luck it was to meet you. It was acquired in 1882. I will look for it. Thank you very much. I would suggest that you organize your books quickly. I am in the habit of visiting my local bookstore at least once a week. You are right, Mr. Holmes. Let's see. The Secret Life of Anchovies. Memoirs of a Public Accountant. Hmm. These books on various wide-ranging subjects are hardly going to be useful. This encyclopedia on plants and spices is just what I need to analyze these so-called perfumes. Let's return to Baker Street. Let's go to Baker Street. need my work table. I need something. Let's get to work. I must analyze these perfumes. These shapes represent the smells at my disposal. This perfume is ghastly.
Excellent. Now on to the next step. Elementary. Fine, I have to go to the brothel. Fine, I have to go to the brothel. I have nothing to ask. So, my dear man, have you reached a verdict? I have distinguished the good perfumes from the bad, but even the good ones are nothing more than common sense for adolescents. <sighs> Who cares? It'll freshen up a few of my girls. Wait, there's a perfume here called Valerian. What is it? It's not really a perfume, technically speaking, unless you like cats. It's more of a kind of medicine. It smells strange. I don't really like it. Here, I can give it to you. And I have some information. Squibby is most assuredly locked up at the police station hereabouts. It would also seem that he's the one who doesn't want to come out. Do you know someone by the name of Danny? Danny? Big Danny Nutcracker? <laughs> the one who hates cats? That's the one. You're interested in that kind of bird? Oh, be like dipping your biscuit in a pig's trough. She's dangerous, a real cyclone. So beware. And her appearance. She claims to adore perfumes. <laughs> She'd need this whole box to smell sweet. I doubt it'll take much to make Danny cooperate, uh, perhaps by offering her a little gift. Let's go to the police station. Bella will help you, sir. You still there, honey pie? I'll be back. You do that. Do you remember me? Would you be kind enough to help me by telling me how many policemen are inside in exchange for this bottle of perfume? This is Perfume. He's got a funny look on his face. Me, I want a pretty bottle with a button so that I can spray it all over myself, got it? Do you remember me? Would you be kind enough to help me by telling me how many policemen are inside in exchange for this bottle of perfume? There ain't much in the station. It was pretty busy, but now there's only one constable, dearie. There we are. Now Danny has been sprayed with valerian, a scent that's irresistible to cats. I must create a diversion in the street to make the policemen come out, but I need some cats. Lots of cats. To the pet shop. 
I must go to the pet shop. It's Mr. Detective. It's... Shh, I'm undercover on a special mission. Don't blow my cover. Aye, aye, Captain. We won't let it slip. Now, what are you doing in this area at such an hour? You're far from home, aren't you? We've come to give Pounce a hand. About his cat, you know. Downstairs round is a nasty old lady Big Danny lives. She threatens to kill Pounce's cat because she's energic, or so she says. And it makes it cough and vomit just by seeing one. Allergic. Oh, that's it. She stoned Pounce and his cat yesterday, and the poor thing took off and hasn't been seen again. We've been looking for it, but nothing. Does that cat there belong to Pounce? Bert! That's my Bertie! Be careful, he is injured. Uh, let's take him to the pet shop. We might be able to take care of him. Let's go to the pet shop, children. If you all go in at once, you'll scare the animals. Pounce, come with me. Everyone else, stay here. What can I do for you? I have come to return your mask. Ah, thank you. If you need something else, do not hesitate. May I present young Pounce and his cat, Bert, Poor Bert, he's been injured. It's Big Danny who threw a cobblestone at him. Big Danny? Danny the Jaw? The Terror of the Highlands? Oi, that's her, mister. You know this lady? Lady is not the appropriate word. Fury, more likely. Danny is a night worker. Before that, she performed in a circus where she fought against men for a penny a round. It was said that she never lost a fight. Is there anything you can do for poor Bert? I don't know. This cat seemed to be in a sorry state. I have a book on cats over there. Can you find it while I look at its wound? Yes. Aha! This must be the cat book Abraham needs. What can I do for you? Here is the book on cats. Thank you, my man. I will see what I can do for this cat. So, how is Bert doing? Uh, he'll pull through, but he must eat, and I have no food for him here. We will need to find him some. And where can we get some cat food? We must find Hardiman. He sells meat for cats. 
It's around this time when he passes the end of the road. <laughs> you might be in luck. You will hear him from far away. He was always calling beep, beep. Thank you for everything, Mr. Solomonovich. So, Pounce, shall we look for the cat food cellar? Poor Bert has to be fed, and I might have some work for you and your friends. Beep, beep. Good evening, sir. How do a little kebab for the cat? These little brats can't possibly all be yours. Pardon? Oh, no, none of them. Ah, children, there are pride and joy, and yet... Do cats really like kebabs? They adore them. How many would you like? I'll take the lot. I beg your pardon, sir? How much for the lot? For two pounds, they're all yours, my lord. It's a deal. Listen up, my little soldiers. You need to find all the cats in Whitechapel and lead them towards the police station. You'll be armed with delicious kebabs to entice them. Go, as quick as you can now. If my calculations are correct, the cats will be seduced by Danny's odour and will throw themselves on her. That should cause enough of a commotion to get the policeman to come out onto the street. Come on now, children. Let the cats alone. What's all this racket? Calm down. Come on, out. And make those cats shut up. Well now, let's see what I can do about Squibby. I shall leave Pluto's treasure at the station. The police will know what to do with it. I shall leave Pluto's treasure at the station. The police will know what to do with it. This must be the door that leads to the cells. This must be the door that leads to the cells.
And who are you? I've come to talk to you about Tumblety. So you're here to kill me, are you? Absolutely not. I've come on behalf of someone you know, who told me you have some explosive news about this American. In exchange, he has settled your bill on the kayaks. You ain't no street person, you. You're a bobby, trying to wind me up, aren't you? Not at all. Will you agree to talk? Not a chance. I'll give nothing away for nothing. I don't have to follow Bluto's orders. I'm in it up to my neck, and the bobbies won't agree to keep me locked up here for the rest of my life. You mean to say that you are here of your own accord? Damn right. Only death awaits me out there. I was almost lynched because I was blamed for the murder of those poor girls who were chopped up like animals. The police put me here for my own safety. That's where this journalist showed up. A journalist? I socked him once for disrespecting me down at the pub. He said I'd pay for it one day. And that day came. He said he was going to squeal to the papers about me. With my description and my tattoos and all, I was arrested at the same time the police said they'd caught the Whitechapel killer. While waiting to write the article, he started the rumour. <sniffs> now the streets ain't safe for me no more. I understand. Listen, if I find this journalist and make him promise to not write a word about you, and if I also agree to pay for you to get out of London, will you tell me everything you know about Tumblety? You sure know how to speak to ruffians, don't you? You got yourself a deal. What's the name of this journalist? Bulling. Tom Bulling. Tom Bulling? That name sounds familiar. That wouldn't be the journalist that Watson met at the Wasp's Nest. Huh? Ah, no, nothing. I was just thinking aloud. Well, I'll be going, Squibby. You're right. It ain't healthy here. Hey, but what are you up to here, you? Off with you, and make it quick before I take you in. Let's go to the wasp's nest. No, if Bluto sees me, it could prove to be quite dangerous. Let's return to Baker Street to change. Good evening. There'll be a nice tip in it for you if you can tell me if you recently saw a journalist here. Yes, sir. A damn nuisance, that man. And a real cad. He cursed me out something fierce for staining a book that he put down, even though it was him who was shaking so much that he soiled it with a whole lot of ale. He was reading a book? <laughs> Not a real book. A halfpenny rag. He put it down on the ground, and I put it in the paper bin for the stove. It should still be there if it weren't already put in the fire. Goodbye, miss. At your service, me lord. Some paper. Ink stains. This must be the table where Bulling writes his copy. Evening. A pint for me and have one for yourself. I'm looking for a journalist, a good client of yours. Goes by the name of Bulling. Ring any bells? Haven't seen him for a day or two. He must be sleeping it off somewhere. Where to hide from the landlord when you owe some serious bread? What paper does he work for? I don't know, but I can't believe that he works at his rag because he's always round the pub scribbling his useless papers. The last time I seen him, he spent all day at that table drinking and scratching away from morning till night. He finished by celebrating, and without the help of a rich chap, he would have fleeced me of a guinea. Thank you, my friend. That's nothing.
Spring-Heeled Jack, a fantastical character that terrorises the population of London. This journalist has some far from cheerful reading. Let's return to Baker Street. Tom Bulling isn't here, but the Baker Street Irregulars should be able to track him down. Perhaps Watson will have something to tell me in the morning. Thank you.